Hi, everyone. Hey. Hola. Hola. How are you? I'm good. I think the sunset is probably going to catch me in the middle of this. That's great. Sí. Um, so sí. jealous. Yeah, I mean, Ponce. I'm in Ponce. Um, wow. In the mountain. So I can, I, yeah, it's it's uncanny and idyllic. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, this is great. I feel very, me siento bien puntual a las cinco empezando esto, but... Uh, Usually something wrong happens and I'm not able to connect, but yeah, hey. we're here. And um, so everyone, um, thank you all for joining. Uh, this is Natalia Lasalle Morillo, uh, an artist from Puerto Rico and a longtime collaborator. Um, mm. And we're going to see some of her work. Um, I don't know if we should start by showing some of your video or maybe um so looking at the stills and then yeah we take it from there see sounds okay. good okay i'm gonna i'm gonna start here cool and i'm gonna show you're gonna lose me because instagram has been super glitchy but yeah <laughs> Um, no, I just wanted to share some of the stills and maybe uh, present the video and then you talk about it or we can do. Chévere. Sí, okay. sí. Whatever works. Do you want to, how do you want to care? Do you want to talk? Yeah, talk about it after something. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to look for it now and play it now. ¿Te escucha? Sí.
Hmm. Do you want to um, end it there or? But yeah, I mean, how do you want to go? Do you want to talk about each piece and then talk about? Yeah. Together. Um, yeah. Uh, just starting with with this uh, with this work. Mm-hmm. See, I hope everybody. I couldn't hear it, so I hope everybody was able. If you were able to hear it, I just. Yeah, I, I was able to hear it because I'm using headphones. But gotcha. yeah. Cool. Well, okay, a little, I think to, in order to talk a little bit about this work and the theater, I have to talk a little bit about like my overall practice. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a theater maker, um, I'm a performer, um, and I also work in installation. I also teach. I think all of these are kind of where my practice lies. Um, and I think my interest really is to reconstruct or reimagine historical narratives and canonical narratives of the dramatic canon um, in order to redundantly reimagine our collective histories. Um, so most of the work that I've been doing in the past couple of years is done in collaboration with non-trained performers um, and with performers. And these are collaborative filmmaking and performance making processes. Um, I think in my practice, I am very much interested in perceptions of history or history as a narrative. It is very rooted in my own experience and confusion growing up in Puerto Rico and not really understanding history until way later in my life where I was faced with the fact that um, I didn't know what was true and what wasn't true. And I think in studying theater, um, since I was a child, but more in, in, you know, in my teenage and in my 20s, I started really becoming amazed by how in theater um, there is this contract between the audience member and the performer mm -hmm. and the audience member and the director. And everything that happens on stage is taken as the truth. And I felt that that was how I related to history. Like, I do not care if it's real or not, because I am so aware that, and I, and I acknowledge the fact that at least in Puerto Rico, our only relationship to history, it has been written by a colonizer or written or misconstrued as part of some political agenda. Um, and the reason why I bring that is because I, I, the works that we're going to be talking about today, I think, lie in, 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 mm -hmm. in this in-between space between documentary and fiction, between performance and film, um, which is I think what I'm constantly thinking about, you know, the inter, the, the middle ground, the in-between space between reality and, and imagined reality and fiction and also life performance and lifeness and, and, and permanence and film. And how can you make film that is ephemeral? How can you make performances that are cinematic? And um, how can you think of filmmaking as a performative act? Like how do the, how does the context and, the people who are performing the characters and um, and everybody who is in, in the process of collaborating, how are they implied in the political context? And also just in the context of being human in making this film. Um, and that leaves us with Retiro. Um, and Retiro, I think, was a huge experiment um, that I did with my mother. Um, and it began in 2015 um, or 2014 after my grandmother died. And my mom was going through her own process of grieving. And I was actually, after studying acting for a long time, I started working on documentary in the whole total opposite spectrum of reality. Um, and I was, ha and I started interviewing my mom. And in the process of interviews, um, I realized, okay, let's just try to make a project together. Um, and let's see where that takes us. Um, and in that process, we decided to write a film together and to write a script together. Um, and I think the rules about this script was that it was based on a memory of her life um, that we wrote, um, that she wrote, and I helped her kind of imagine in a cinematic form. Um, but she could imagine it and remember it however she wanted. Like the purpose of it was not the veracity of the film, but more how she decided to remember it. and. For the first part of the film, I was more of a producer um, and I was just trying to help her think think from a directorial approach to making it um, and she could cast anybody. She styled the whole film 
And in that process, she wanted me to perform. She wanted me to perform the part of her in the film, um, which was very problematic. And I didn't want to do because I was really trying to not act anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but, she, but then I surrendered to it. And it became a monster after that because it wasn't, you know, we made this film together where I uh, embody her young self um, in a pretty dramatic uh, narrative. And the film, to be honest, is not that great. Um, but, but I think what, what ended up happening was that I think her and I just became fascinated about everything that surrounded the film. So it became much more a film about the process of making this film. Um, and it focuses on the simultaneous experiences and perspectives that, that inhabit the, the filmmaking process. So the film itself, her process of directing me, and also just her mundane life, and also the context of the things that were happening in Puerto Rico during those five years. Because mm -hmm. it started in 2015, which was before Promesa, and it ended, I actually finished the film during the week that uh, Ricardo Rosselló was ousted. So all of that is sort of inserted in this narrative and in the way that my mom remembers her life growing up in Bayamón. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really became much more of a co collaboration between the two of us in order to, to get over or to, I, I would say, reorganize our own ancestral trauma <laughs> in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's more of like a love project than anything else. Um, and what we're seeing now is the installation piece because it is a three channel film. Um, and it, each channel um, is a different, one of these different perspectives, one being the film, one being the behind the scenes and one being our relationship during those five years. Um, and it has had different showings. Like this one was in a site specific uh, presentation that we did in Bayamon in my godmother's house. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it had, um, we had um, una mesita en la marquesina and we had um, sanguchitos de mezcla. <laughs> <laughs> um, but usually the presentation of this piece is what we saw before, which is on projecting the three channels on these vertical blinds, um, which I've been working with. I've been thinking for many years on how to think about projection or how to think about installation and film in a theatrical way and how to mm -hmm. create a space of context for the film to be experienced. And I've been working with these materials for a while, but then I realized it belongs to this work mainly because those were the blinds that I grew up in the house that I grew up in. Um, and, you know, when you're thinking about projection, you're also thinking about how light projects onto a surface and transforms a space. So yeah. the installation of this work is really focused on how, on, on how to think of my mother's house, how to think of the memories of her house growing up, and then how to create an immersive space where the audience member or the spectator is inhabiting the filmmaking experience too. Yeah, totally. And did your mother also uh, took part of the installation decisions or? <laughs> I mean, yes. Um, yes and no. I say yes because originally, I, I don't think I've actually Rex Bale full Rex Bale. <laughs> um, my initial idea for this installation work uh, was conceived with my mom. And my mom is a fascinating human in the sense that she's very studious and in the film you know she there's a whole section where she quotes Plato and she's always thinking in an intellectual in, in an intellectual uh, way and uh, the original installation was actually a recreation of her living room with all of these books so she shipped um, all of the original copies of the books with all of her annotations because they in a way shaped part of segments of the film um, and she didn't really agree with the vertical blinds because the, the vertical blinds that we used were actual real vertical blinds from the house. Um, <laughs> but with time, I think we are still reimagining how this works mm -hmm. for the next time that we present it. Yeah. My mother is very much a part of it. Um, and I think in many ways it's an ode to her. Yeah. So, I'm constantly thinking about how to get her involved in everything that I do. So, no, oh, she's amazing. <laughs> I'm a big fan, you know it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think that you know, this is something that you practice a lot. You kind of um, make experiments with your work and, you know, kind of show it in different ways. Um, 
and this is what we're gonna see for yeah this other work that it's um, at La Ruta, um, which was a project that you did with Erika Rodriguez and Chris Gregory, and had, uh, various uh, different elements of of going and cruising through um, La Ruta, um, La Ruta um, Panoramica, which is a, a very nice. Uh, road to go to on a road trip if you're in Puerto Rico everyone goes there um, and I want you to talk a little bit about uh, doing this project uh, that I, I love so much um, and what the meaning of, of progress is for so many Puerto Ricans but also I mean it's just an idea mm -hmm. and that it can be so many other things you know mm. um, And also you have shown in different ways and um, mm -hmm. yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about it or should I play the video? Sí, I can talk about it to give some context, but okay. uh, La Ruta del Progreso, La Ruta, is a project that I did, like Natalia, Natalia Mitocaya said, with Chris and, and Erika, Christopher Gregory Rivera and Erika Rodriguez. Um, to um, people that I love very, very much, um, both photographers on their own right and artists on their own right. And the whole, I think the whole, um, the whole project really, I want to say, <laughs> is really follows the structure of a road trip. And I think they presented the project to me because they've been work they were working on it uh, for a year before I joined into, into this collaborative process. But um, Chris and Erika and I were very much interested in in the original um, the original purpose that Luis Muñoz Marin had for this route. Um, it was the he was the, it was like the baby. It was one of his ba his many babies in in in, in his, his many babies of, of the colonial project. <laughs> his many babies of the colonial project. And La Ruta Panoramica was a road that is a road that stretches from Maunabo to Mayagüez, and it's part of the colonial project of progress that Luis Muñoz Marín had envisioned for Puerto Rico. However, um, it costs, um, more, I think, more than $19 million to construct. It was extremely expensive. And it, 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 the, the whole infrastructure of the road is accompanied by recreational infrastructure. And it was part of this agenda to create a version of the Route 66 in Puerto Rico, like a, a, a version of a route that assimilated the experience of crossing through the United States and that tourists and Puerto Ricans alike could cross through the, you know, could cross through this route and, and understand like, wow, we have such an amazing place. And this is, you know, we are really getting to that to, you know, we're really getting to that progress, but the reality of the matter. And I think that was also at least my intention was to transverse, traverse this route and really take my time to to really think of what are the spaces and who are the people that live in the periphery and the peripheral towns or the towns adjacent to this route because it really you know i a lot of one of the questions that we had when we started this project was what is progress to the people that live in this area to the people that had to be expropriated because of the construct construction of this massive project colonial project and I, I think also, I think I entered the project from a very humble place because I am not from the Cordillera Central. I am not from the Ruta Panoramica. I grew up in Bayamón. So my experience of that area was also a very fragmented experience. And it, it was also, I think, my intention was really to just listen and surrender to, mm -hmm. to, to this journey and to what what would happen and what what would happen to the three of us if we took our time and stopped and conversed and observed these spaces? Um, you know, and I think in our conversations, as you said, Natalia, it's really, you know, about how the, you know, what we were trying to understand was what is this colonial imaginary? You know, what is this project? And how, 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 what does progress mean to a people, to a collective consciousness that is constantly reimagining themselves and constantly right. reimagining their history? Um, so at least my portion in this project was this also a three channel film. Um, and it, um, the film 
uh, focuses on creating sort creating an immersive landscape and also to create the experience of stopping. So it's very long meditative shots. Uh, a lot of attention was paid to the sound, and it's in it's woven in with these interviews that we carried out um, with locals that reside in that area. Um, and here you can see some of the different. Um, installation um installation renditions of the work i think the first one i carried out actually with natalia i think i presented this work with you twice um, yes with erica and chris um and we tried we i think with you it was like the very experimental phase of re of thinking i think it was when i started really thinking about not projecting on walls and projecting mm -hmm. and thinking of where i'm projecting on and like mm -hmm. how how that material um, relates to the context of the film and how does that change, uh, that, how does that create a visceral experience for the spectator? Um, and I think um, we experimented with the blinds because I think I was very into that for a while. We experimented with using different types of fabric. And the last rendition, which was one that I worked with a Puerto Rican curator called Darina Perdomo in um, the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago, for an exhibit that w what took place la uh, last, um, it was postponed so many times because of COVID, but last September, um, we, um, I collaborated with a uh, with, um, um, textile maker and designer called um, Agnes Anna Sabo. And we made um, these curtains that are actually, um, they're composed of abaca, which is banana fiber, maguey and piña silk. Um, and the idea was to kind of relate it much more to um, these traditional practices, particularly, you know, uh, abaca and that are not, you know, that are still somewhat preserved on the island and mm -hmm. how, and how, what is it like to create a space taking those, those practices in consideration. And each space has a ham, like every rendition has had hammocks. <laughs> um, and I think it has also been part of the intention of creating a place where the audience member sits in and it's a much more intimate uh, relationship to the work. Yeah. Did we see the video? <laughs> this is, I think, a one panel excerpt of one of the... Yeah. Let's see if I can uh do this without messing it up you can do it <laughs> wait a second too many slides um it's a production mm -hmm. <laughs> okay 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 now you can hear the cookies mm -hmm. i took my headphones mm -hmm. so i can hear I haven't heard cookies in so long. Aquí vamos a escuchar cinematic cookies and real cookies. Right.
<laughs> that one is my favorite my favorite character from that <laughs> video come on he's 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 special he i mean it's interesting too because when you know when you're making a film there's so much um, material and i i think when i was editing this i realized oh i could make a film out of each person that we interviewed, mm -hmm. and he was definitely one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you go back to see? I mean, to to, because I remember when we were talking that you always wanted to bring that la ruta to la ruta, you know, mm -hmm. to the people. Were you able to do that with this project? See, I mean, it was something that we started doing um, right after the exhibition. Mm -hmm. that we did in, in in San Juan and I think my intention was always like you know this is a work that for me is for the is for the people and so show, always showing it in like a gallery context feels like a bit just like I was like no it needs to like if, if this is gonna happen this also needs to happen and we actually did uh, had a couple of screenings um, in collaboration with the Cine Rodante mm -hmm. de Cultura um, and it was also, you know, that was also a very interesting <laughs> process of, of, re of the work returning back because I think I didn't really understand how, how it would, how, how it would be received. And we showed it in Mayagüez and Eduardo Escalera, who is, uh, one of the, one of the people we interviewed in Mayagüez came, um, we showed it also, which is, um, in the South of Morovis, which is not Puerto La Ruta, but. Um, we had an opportunity of screening it there, um, and it was a project that I think we were really interested in in continuing. And then COVID happened, and mm -hmm. I still think that this project hasn't really ended for Chris, Erika, and I. Like we still think of of what it is to return now, and because the panoramic route is really a twilight zone, and there's so much of it that um, we weren't really able to to document and explore within the two weeks that we tra that we traversed it. Um, um, so it, it, I think that I, I am very much still interested on in continuing it and continuing showing it. Um, I think one of the most amazing moments for me, which I wasn't able to see her, but I know um, Cuckoo, uh, Cookie was able to go. Yeah, um, I, I, to... Saw, I mean, we met. Sí. We met um, in the garden. Yeah, we met in the gallery. Mm -hmm. And it's see, like for me, that was that was all. Like to make sure that she was able to see, because I feel that especially when you're working with, you know, with people who who who, you know, who, who think differently about filmmaking. I, for me, it's important to understand. Like this is the context that you are existing, and like for them to really understand that it's as much as I am editing, it's really a collaboration. Like without them, I cannot make this happen either. Um, so it, 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 it filled my heart to know that she was able to go and, yes. and see it too. 
yeah, it was very special. Um, I remember that day. And your mom went, went, you know, came by to the gallery too. Mm -hmm. First, and it was really great. Um, okay, so we are on to the next one. I think this is... Uh... Yes. I think we can talk about conversations because yeah. there's no film. We didn't have the yeah. film. It's um, in Cuba, right? Yeah, Olguin is the one that I did with Cuba in Cuba. I can, I can speak quickly about it. Um, it's a project that I did in Cuba with um, a... Um, a woman that I met <laughs> when I lived in Miami, because I lived in Miami for around five years. Um, um, but that, is, I mean, that is a different project that really kind of tries, it's it's part of the Retiro process, Alguien um, Hialeah, the one that I did in Cuba. Um, but it, it was a collaboration between me and Alvisa Chavarria, um, where we tried to reenact. She moved to Miami at age 80, and the whole project was us reenacting um that her memories of cuba in places in miami that alluded to a cuban imaginary um and then we returned to cuba and traced it back to cuba we returned to cuba and traced all those memories back to cuba but i think the project that's a different project um this project that we're looking at now is a long term i think you can go maybe a little bit back to the slides because i think we're gonna get yeah. there but okay um, a project called conversations on tragedy which is a project that I'm working on now and that I've been working on for maybe three years already. Um, but conversation on, Conversations on Tragedy is a multi-platform project. So it's a film, it's a film that is recorded live, it's a live performance, it's a documentary project, um, but it is, um, it investigates the accumulation of tragedy, of political, atmospheric, um, seismic, spiritual tragedies, economical tragedies in Puerto Rico through Greek tragedy. So the longer, you know, the, the large scale um, of this project um, is a collaboration between um, Puerto Rico, myself, and Puerto Ricans that reside on the archipelago of Puerto Rico, and then Puerto Ricans that reside on the diaspora. And the project really attempts to adapt uh, Antigone and um, the play of Antigone in co with a cast that is composed of this mixture of Puerto Ricans and I think my intention behind that is to mimic um, the, con the, the initial intention of Greek tragedy in ancient, in ancient Greece which really the original intention was to create a forum where people who went to war and people who stayed in the city state could commune and find a collective understanding of the conditions and the consciousness of, of, of the state after war and therefore have collective catharsis. And I think this is something that I've been thinking about ever since I, I started studying uh, the Greek canon again and thinking about how the Greeks are not traditional at all and how their methods of, of really creating a society were really messed up but also really performative. Um, so this is a project that I'm working on now, um, and like I said, it's a lot. It's a large scale project because I started it with my mother, and I think we were able to see some photos of that earlier, um, and that was, I think, my first attempt to crack um, what it would be like to adapt Antigone with somebody who is not a performer and who is not an actor, and the purpose of it is really to. I think this is, I think, the project that is really getting at my interest of, of deconstructing canonical narratives, of re-understanding history, of using the, 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 the text of the play in, all, in order and redirecting it to one's own perspective. Um, and I think in this case with conversations, it's really redirecting it to the multiple and simultaneous perspectives that exist towards Puerto Rico. And... Um, and really, I think because of this accumulation of tragedy that has taken place in the last hundred years, but particularly in the last 10 years with the hurricane, with the earthquakes, with the Promesa Vil, with Ricky Renuncia, which for me is really like the, the embodiment of collective catharsis and grief um, and Dionysian, you know, the Dionysian experience of, of, of exerting all that, all that catharsis, that, that a new consciousness of the Puerto Rican is emerging. And I don't know what that is. And I don't know what that looks like. So I think that project 
wants to do that, <laughs> you know, wants to figure out and wants to investigate what that is um, in collaboration with Puerto Ricans that live throughout the United States and the island. Yeah. And these are, but these are, and these live in a theatrical um, scenario or is this also like performance, video performance? What, what would you call this? So I think conversations for me really exists in different stratospheres. Like I think my, the way that I'm, that I'm carrying, I'm, it's in progress right now. So I'm carrying out interviews and I'm filming and my plan before COVID and now that co things are hopefully ho opening up is to cast, uh, to carry out a document, like a filmmaking process. So first it's, 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 Like I think the film that is going to come out of it is a fiction and documentary hybrid. Um, and I will be traveling to Orlando. I will be traveling to New York City um, and Chicago and Buffalo, New York and work. And my intention is to meet and work with the Puerto Rican diasporas there. And I have a, sub, a couple of people I'm collaborating with in these locations. Um, and then with Puerto Ricans here. And I think the first part of the process really is a filmmaking process. But I think in the larger scheme, in the dreamscape, which is what I'm trying to envision right now, it would be a live performance, um, a performance that would, be, that would be filmed live. Um, and that all of these people that I've worked in throughout the different notes of the diaspora and the archipelago would come together and perform the play. Um, but I think that like, that's why I say that it's a long term project because it requires uh, a lot of moving parts and it's like a massive, <laughs> a massive undertaking. But I'm kind of slowly, I've been slowly building up to, to a place where I can hopefully uh, get, uh, make it happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this is also part of that project or this is a new, uh, different one? No, these are actually, I mean, this is definitely, I think, in the journey of this conversation, we're like going into the film, into the performance and then out. This is actually stills of, um, I think I've been working with Greek tragedies for four years now. And this is actually una puesta de escena that I did of Antigone. So this is like a staging of Antigone that I did mm -hmm. um, two years ago in the Walt Disney Modular Theater in California. Um, and this was very much, um, I would say, like a theatrical work. Like, I think it was the first time that I that I adventured into saying, okay, I'm, I'm actually not going to work with documentary whatsoever, and I'm going to work with fiction. Um, and that didn't work. Like, I think I the, the, the whole play cracked open and, and became <laughs> documentary <laughs> at some point. Um, but I think I mean, I, the reason why I wanted to show these these photos and these stills too is because uh, I think in in the work that I that I've been developing in collaboration with other artists, um, I I'm trying to really honor theater and honor performance and live performance and find a way to integrate that more into into the filmmaking practice um, and vice versa. So I think now I'm trying to get from the theater and put it more in the film and get from the film and put it more <laughs> in the liveness. Yeah, it makes sense. Also, it's kind of your process of understanding and, you know, kind of being there and, um, you know, being part of, of putting yourself also, you know, poner, poner el cuerpo también en esta mm -hmm. situación. Um, so, yeah, this is more more of the process. Mm -hmm. Oh, but then this is another work. <laughs> okay. um, so yeah, this um, this work, which is also in progress right now, and I'm also trying to figure out um, where it exists because part of me sometimes feel that it's actually part of the tragedy project, but as of now, I'm dealing it dealing with it as an as an individual piece. Um, it's called Paro Triptico, and it's a work that is actually composed of footage that was shot um, during the 2019 protests um, that ousted Ricardo Rosselló. And I think this, I, I want to say that this one was actually kind of accidental. And I mean that in the most honest way possible, um, because I, um, I think when the protest happened, 
many, I think many image makers, and I want to say photographers and filmmakers went out with cameras and equipment and were like, we have to document this process. We have to document what's happening because it was so uncanny and so mm -hmm. unprecedented in the history of, in the history of Puerto Rico that for some, for some cosmic alignment, we all agreed in one thing and were able to carry it out through the end. And when, when these protests were happening, I was reading and thinking a lot about the metaphysical aspect of a, process, of a protest and the erotic experience of the protest, which is aligned and sometimes has nothing to do with the outcome and the effectivity of the protest. And I was thinking about that and then thinking that I was going to go to the protest to document it and I failed because I was taken away by the metaphysics of the protest and how erotic and how so many things are happening at the same time. And in these protests, you know, there, there was there were the actual protests. There was police brutality. There were also protests by horse protests, under scuba protests, yoga protests, motorcycle protests. So it was really this very chaotic and erotic environment. And I took my camera and I tried to shoot, um, but I forgot about shooting. And it the reason why I say that it is accidental is because I left my camera on and I ended up one night shooting like I don't even know how many minutes of footage that I was unaware of the fact that I was shooting and in that process um, me and my friends um, were uh, like many other people it's not an individual experience I think it happened in the protest in the states but in Puerto Rico the police released gas and all of this was recorded on camera and I didn't really know what to do with it because I realized that in protest especially everything that it, like when i'm making images in puerto rico i'm always thinking about how it's been received in the united states and mm -hmm. uh, and that goes to everything that goes from hurricanes that goes to documentary that goes to fiction that goes to protest because i feel that the images that were taken out like the images are taken out of context and um i this is for me really uh, like i realize it's from an attempt to deconstruct the documentary and to deconstruct the idea of how you document the protest and really think about the subjective experience um and to break it apart to a point that you really cannot think logically because that is the experience of being in a protest um and it focuses much more on the conversations that were filmed and recorded <laughs> during um, during this time and unconsciously recorded. Um, and it is much more of a personal account. And it's not even my own personal account. It's the personal account of the people that were accompanying me. Like my cousin was with me. Um, so it's much more of, 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 of our own disbelief at what was happening and our own telling of the live events as they were happening. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a work that I'm that I'm currently I've been working on um, since last year, and I've shown I've developed it as a work in progress. As an it's an installation work, um, so it, it's I think it's like three channels or four channels. Um, but I've also been thinking about it much more as a one channel or work, um, so that. Um, so that it can exist in a different in a different way of engaging because I think with installation work um, it's not as accessible for a lot of people too um, but this is yeah this is very much uh, an experiment in progress also because it's material that is very sensitive there's faces of people there's faces of a lot of people and um, I am very aware of that and what that can mean in a country that has been surveilled by the police and by the government for so many years. So I've been really trying to also to also take that in consideration, even though um, I'm sure that some people would be okay with me showing their faces. I, I, I have to be sensitive. I think my, my inner person is sensitive about that. Yeah, and also your responsibility as, as yeah, someone that also directs, you know, is also pretty much, there um in these situations as a mm -hmm. performer or yeah producer or yeah the artist um i want to show a little bit of video if that's okay mm -hmm. yeah. okay mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was uh, a little bit of the video. And um, yeah, I want to welcome uh, people to ask questions. If you have um, a question for Natalia, um, and yes, um, I remember this day. I was I was not in Puerto Rico. I was not in the U.S. I think I was traveling. Um, and yeah, we were a group of, of people. It was like Alejandro, Eduardo, everyone. We were all uh, connected to the phone and to, you know looking at lives. And we were, I think we were in Berlin or something. And we were like there on our way somewhere. But we were just like so connected. And that was the only way that we could see what was happening. Um, it was really insane. Mm -hmm. uh, sí. But I mean, I'm to be there also and to experience it. Sí. And, and, you know, it was also for me, like, I mean, not for me, I want to say for a lot of people, I, you know, I, I think of my, uh, of, I think there is like a, um, like a whole, you know, there's Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, but I think there's a whole group of Puerto Ricans that are in betweeners, <laughs> that are really in between. Like in between, I don't know where. I feel I'm one of these people. And I think when this happened, um, I know myself and also a couple of friends, we I flew. I didn't I, I left everything. I was like, I need to feel this in body. I need to feel this in in I need to feel what this is. I need to understand what this is and and I don't think I could have handled looking at all the at all the live and all the because also it was like a very chaotic experience of of really experiencing the events through social media and organization through social media and um and I think that was a huge part of what actually made these um was what made these protests successful was how how social media of course aided the dissemination of all of this information. Um, but I think it, it for me, it was as somebody who was not present and during the hurricane and who I think had, you know, I think I, I, I had my own experience of understanding grief after the hurricane. And I think the hurricane was a huge moment of, of, of collective grief and different experience of grief, which I think goes into, you know, what I mentioned earlier about the tragedy. And this moment, is really a, a moment of collective catharsis of you know i think I, w I was thinking not too long ago maybe a week ago i was like i don't know what the last party i went to was i have no idea before COVID. i think this was the last party i went to <laughs> and i have such a profound memory of the day that ricky was um was supposed to give his speech and what old san juan this was that day what old san juan felt like and I had never experienced such uh, an immensity of, of a spiritual and sexual liberation, erotic liberation on the <laughs> island. Um, because people were just, you know, like letting everything um, manifest. Um, <laughs> que, que loco, Guillermo, I know. <laughs> yeah, ese fue el verano combativo, that's how we call it. Um, yeah. It was pretty intense. Um, and it's exactly how you, how you, you know, you talk about it and have you, have you tried to kind of write these feelings also or like, just, I mean, it's such, when I talk, when I think about Puerto Rico and the Caribbean and all of these uh, subjects, you know, there's a lot of feelings that go, um, like, and and it's it's a lot of um in it's just a lot of intensity coming from everywhere and i don't know if you experience that in your work or cuz i feel it when when i see your work um yeah i mean i think it's it's interesting for me and not even interesting is not the right word that's definitely not the right word it has been a constant question for me because right. i think uh, being a, a person who is constantly changing um like i've been i before 
the pandemic, I was moving around so much and I was kind of living a really unsustainable nomadic lifestyle. And I was asked a lot, like, why Puerto Rico? Like, I would try to explain to people Puerto Rico and what made it special for me. And of course, there is a whole very intricate political and economic experience that has made, uh, also created a consciousness. But for me, I always bring it down to how I feel, to how my body feels. And I, I, I don't want to intellectualize, intellectualize something that cannot be intellectualized. You know, it's, it's really, for me, is physical and it's visceral and it's a gravitational pull. Um, and I recently, I've been thinking a lot about the gravitational pull in relationship also to the earthquakes and in relationship to the fact that right north of Puerto Rico is La Fosa de Puerto Rico. It's a Puerto Rico trench and it's the, one of the places with the highest percentage of negative gravity in the whole planet definitely in the atlantic and i don't know i'm not a geologist you know i i i would never venture to say that i know but i i do i i feel that there's something there's there's a lot of forces that are moving in this place and i even think of that when i when i when i when i consider the diaspora and when i consider you know meeting people from the diaspora and seeing how they are physically moved, understanding how they are physically transformed because of things that take place in a place that they maybe had not even stepped upon. And that for me is, is beyond, I don't have words to describe what that effect is, mm -hmm. you know. I, and I've met many people that are from, you know, that are from diasporas of other places throughout the world. And I think that with Puerto Rico is just, you know, I don't think, I don't know if it does it, you know, they say it's a Puerto Rican syndrome, but I think it's something that I don't, I still don't have words to describe mm -hmm. what that consciousness is. And is that part of the project that you're working on? This is the question that you're asking or? Yeah, it is the question that I'm asking. And I think more than a question, it's also a consideration because I feel that as a, as a Puerto Rican woman that grew up on the island um, with having family, in New York, having family in the Bronx, having family in Miami. I never, I never knew how to understand. And I was also in fault at a point in time of, not, of, of maybe not considering that experience as one that is valid. And I had to slap myself in the face and really understand that who am I to claim ownership over every, an experience? And that it is, you know, the experience of the multiple diasporas is rich and it's just different. And, you know, I think I started understanding this much more when I experienced tragedy from afar, when I experienced Hurricane Maria and I wasn't on the island. Mm -hmm. And I realized, wow, okay, I am feeling all of these feelings. I am feeling all of this pain. And I, I didn't experience it. I experienced it in a different way. And, I, and so it is part of the questions that I'm asking, but also I'm thinking much more of, of how can, how can, I facilitate a forum of dialogue mm -hmm. and a forum of conversation where all of these simultaneous perspectives can can be experienced and 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 not judged mm -hmm. and allow them just to coexist yeah. and to disagree. You know, like we don't need to agree. I think we're all trying to to conceptualize our own idea of of identity and history and myth. So I think it's part of the questions that I'm that I am interested in right now, um, and feel that you know, performance is actually a very uh, is the is the medium that can handle that can that can handle these questions. That was beautiful, Natalia. Right. <laughs> You're like you know thinking about all these things, and if I, you know, asking myself while you were talking, did I ever went through like a process of griefing? I don't think so. Um, did it have a closure? No. Yo creo que no. Um, yeah. And it keeps happening. So how are we going to perform um, through all of these things that keep coming at us? And I'm talking about, you know, is like issues around the world as well that we can relate to. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this morning I was listening to La Brega um, yeah, I'm giving like an unofficial marketing spiel. <laughs> I was listening to the podcast that just came out. <laughs> yes, 
that um, some of our friends are part of. And I was thinking, you know, the first episode is really an explanation of the word La Brega. And I think that in Puerto Rico, we, be, we have a PhD on bregar. You know, yeah. like we have a PhD in, on, in just carrying through. Um, and that I feel is what, I'm, what I am thinking of. That is this consciousness that has emerged from grief. Um, where we just find a way to deal with the material conditions of our of our land, and yeah. even if we're not here, we find a way to just manage. Um, I'm I don't have a PhD on that. I'm still working on it, but I think that um, we're all trying to figure out a way to deal with yeah. with that for with with the grief that we are just not aware even of that we've accumulated, maybe. What I what I'm like really pissed about is that this word resilience, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, maybe we can bregar, you know. But I mean, first, and that's just resilience is so different for you know many peoples. But uh, but um, yeah, just I'm thinking about that also because I was listening to La Brea this morning and I was like, wow, this is. Yeah, it is bregar, you know? It is dealing with the situation. It is, like, carrying through. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't think anyone else uses that word. See, It's just, I, right? Yeah, I was explaining it to it because I think this, this concept of bregar, you know, I'm not, I'm, is something that is not limited to Puerto Ricans. Like, mm -hmm. I think of this a lot when I, when I, when I think, for example, of, Uh, of Le of the Lebanese community mm -hmm. and the Lebanese community has gone through so much and it's I think it's 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 for me when I when I read and I talk to my Lebanese friends I am I'm like wow that is a PhD in Bregar that is a PhD in, mm -hmm. in in community in community organization um and I I was explaining it to one of my students today because I didn't have a word to translate Bregar without it being resilience and i realized it's not resilience that's not the no. word because resilience has a con has a different connotation like i think bregar really is like how can you deal with the with the material conditions and find a way to continue existing <laughs> you know? I, um, i also feel that resiliency it's passive and bregar is active mm -hmm. you know hmm. and yeah i don't know we can keep talking about this offline mm -hmm. because we have just less than a minute and I just wanted to thank you so much for being here it's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be in conversation no, I'm with them. so happy it happened and yeah uh, thank you so much and um, I'll look forward to seeing you someday in Puerto Rico <laughs> Igualmente. and thank you to everybody who joined I saw Ashley's here I saw some really Some people yeah. I really love and admire um, popping through the virtual sphere. So thank you for making time to join another virtual <laughs> gathering. I know my fourth program. <laughs> Less than 10 ten, ten days. Hopefully, um, hopefully we will have a, a, a visceral, in-person, embodied gathering. Por uh, <laughs> favor. <laughs> bueno, ahora con Nati. Vale, chao. Bye. Yeah. Chao.